Quinton de Kock was smashing the ball everywhere against Zimbabwe. He was clearly on a mission. South Africa weren't really fighting their fellow African nation. They had already destroyed them. They were just trying to beat the Hobart weather. And in truth, you could see that they were always losing that battle. This game probably shouldn't have gone ahead. No World Cup match should be played in conditions this wet. The South African bowlers could barely grip the ball in the second part of their effort. It had continued to rain, and quite heavily at this point, and the Zimbabweans could barely stand up on parts of the field. QDK, for everything that he could do, hit the ball as hard as he could, hoping he could beat the rain. No one actually knew what any of this meant at that point. South Africa still had a lot of games to go. Yes, if Pakistan had a brilliant tournament from then on in, it could cause problems for South Africa. But as Pakistan lost to Zimbabwe themselves, this game was kind of discarded. And now it looks like another match that cost them a crack at the World Cup. The umpires did try and push this result far beyond where they ever should have. The ICC clearly wanted a result as much as South Africa did. And eventually it took Zimbabwean captain Sean Williams turning to the umpire and saying, this is a World Cup. That was enough to eventually make the umpires realize that this was just not fit conditions. It was not a game that should ever have gone ahead. You could almost argue it maybe never should have started. But that comment means something else as well. For South Africans, it's almost spine chilling. South Africa were actually part of the reason that the ICC exists. In order to have a triangular tournament between England, Australia and South Africa, they formed the Imperial Cricket Conference, or as we now call it, the International Cricket Council. They were terrible in that first ICC event. They had two 10 wicket losses and also two that they lost by an innings. There was one match where they did a little bit better. Against Australia, they managed 329 the South Africans on what was a soaking wet pitch. The following day, they dismissed them for 219 runs, giving themselves a healthy lead. The third and final day, not a single ball was delivered because there was rain. We think about South Africa's bad form and luck in World Cups starting in 1992. No, you have to go back to 1912 to see where this all began. But 1992 was, of course, something else. South Africa were chasing an improbable total of 22 runs off the final 13 deliveries in the World Cup semi-final against England. They had been a little bit behind the rate for quite some time, but the partnership at the crease of Brian McMillan and Dave Richardson had already scored 25 from 18. However, 22 from 13 that was required was still big cricket money. When they came back out, however, after the rain break, they needed 22 runs still. Now it was off a single ball. It was made even more bizarre by the fact that South Africa had to go out and face that ball anyway with the new equation slapped up on the screen. This actually would help change the playing conditions of cricket and it's really what led to us starting to use the Duckworth-Lewis method. Of course, the very interesting thing about that is that even had the Duckworth-Lewis method been used at that time, South Africa still would not have been able to win the game. But because it looked so silly and it was up on the big screen and Brian McMillan was so upset, he became the poster boy for the first South African loss. Sadly, there's been quite a few since then. In 1999, South Africa were an absolute machine when it came to ODI cricket. They were actively changing the game by using Alan Donald as a first change bowler and Lance Klusener playing T20 cricket before we'd even invented it. Their record coming into that World Cup was as dominant as any team has ever been, even more so than Australia, who would go on to win three World Cups on the bounce. And it was Klusner who was smashing Australia all around that World Cup semi-final. And it was Australia who was panicking and choking all over the place, until South Africa got the scores level, and they needed one more run to win, and for some reason, Klusner suddenly changed the way he was batting. And in the space of two balls, Australia had two separate run-out chances. They missed the first, and they got the second. Nice strike. There it is. They go for this. It'll be out, surely. Ah, oh, it's out. It's going to be run out. Oh, 
That's it. South Africa out. Donald didn't run. I cannot believe it. Pitch, here he comes. Alan Donald, look, he's going back to his crease. The throw misses. Fleming gets it. He hasn't even got a bat. Here's the throw. Gilchrist won't fumble. Four years later, in the next World Cup in 2003, South Africa only went and tied again. They were hosting their first World Cup. It was a huge moment for cricket in that region, and South Africa found themselves in a must-win rain-hit game against Sri Lanka. There was a lot of pressure. If you don't believe me, here is Kumar Sangakara explaining just how much pressure there was. Oh, there's lots of pressure here for the skippy, eh? Gonna let his whole country down now if he fails. Oh, lots of expectations, fellas. Come on. Oh man, the weight of all these expectations, fellas. The weight of the country, chaps. 42 million supporters right here, depending on Sean. But it was Mark Boucher who was facing Murley. He smacked the wet ball for six and he looked completely on top at that stage. And to get ahead of the DLS, which, as we've already mentioned, South Africa inspired the use of, Boucher just needed a single. Instead, they misunderstood the DLS, and they thought by being equal, they were actually in front in the game. So off the last ball of that over, Boucher defended, and the scores remained tied, and South Africa were out of their home World Cup before the second round, basically before the serious stuff had even begun. In the quarterfinals of the 1996 World Cup, they dropped Alan Donald for their spinner, Paul Adams. Brian Lara absolutely destroyed them while their best bowler sat on and could only watch. Lara particularly went after Adams, who wasn't quick enough through the air and allowed Lara to just get on top of him. Eventually, Adams would be yanked from the attack, Lara would make 100, and when he was finally out, Adams would come back on to bowl at the end. South Africa batted well, it just wasn't enough. In 2011, they kept New Zealand to only 221 runs in their quarterfinal, and their batting lineup included Hashim Amla, Graham Smith, Jax Callis, A.B. De Villiers, and Faf Du Plessis. Amla hit a ball onto the keeper's foot, only to be caught at slip. But outside of that, it was really just the Kiwis keeping the pressure on them brilliantly. So much so that Kyle Mills and other players who weren't even playing for New Zealand, when they went out to take drinks, started sledging the South Africans as they batted. It was remarkably easy to see how New Zealand just kept all that pressure on them, and South Africa just completely wilted. Shall we move on to the T20 World Cups? Let's start with the fact that they have the third best win-loss ratio in the history of T20 World Cups, and they have never even made a final. Every other team with an above 50% win percentage, except for New Zealand, has won a tournament. And to be fair to New Zealand, they have at least made the final. In 2014, South Africa got to the semi-finals where they played India. They set 173, and Virat hit 72 from 44. They didn't even need all of the last over India to win that one. In 2009, South Africa won every single match in the early rounds, and then met Pakistan in the semi-finals. They had to chase 150, and despite losing only five wickets, they never really got in front, as Callis and JP Dumini batted for a long time, but never particularly that fast. But mostly they ran into Shahid Afridi, he was playing T20 cricket when there was no T20 cricket. And that is not even including the many other T20 World Cups, or World T20s as they were at that time, that they never even made it that far for. And since we're looking at other tournaments, why not the Champions Trophy? I think I need to be really honest here. I would never want to give the Champions Trophy too much credit. I personally do not see it as a major event. Almost no teams planned for it. It got cancelled a couple of times, has had three different names that I know of. It's really a good tournament that's on when it's on, but no one cares about it that much. The term major is really being stretched when we're talking about the Champions Trophy. But I mention all that because of how many times they made the finals and knockout games in that particular tournament as well, and it still never went anywhere. And I haven't mentioned every single time where something went wrong, just because... This would actually go on forever if I just listed all the different ways in which South Africa have struggled in these major tournaments. I want this to be an autopsy, but let's be honest, it's probably more like uh, a checkup. I can't look under the hood of the many, many different things that led to each specific exit just because they've had 
so many exits and there almost never seems to be one reason why they are out of the tournament. It always seems to be an accumulation of random things that when they happen at the time, you don't even think to yourself, well, this is a reason that they're going to go out. But there is something else that I really want to mention here. South Africa have the best record in limited overs cricket in the history of the game. Their win percentage is better than Australia over T20 and ODIs. In fact, it is better than everyone's in cricket history. If you look at ODI cricket, there is not a team with a better than 50% win record against them. They just roll through bilateral cricket like white ball Godzilla. The minute the ICC slaps a logo or something on the front of a tournament, South Africa completely fall apart. And if you want proof of this, well, here is the strongest thing I can give. The South Africans have won a single major multi-team event. I think it's major. Well, we're going to throw it in for now anyway. The Commonwealth Games, in which the matches were not official ODIs, and it also was not an ICC event. Do you see what I'm saying? You take off the ICC, and suddenly the 110 years of history fades away, and South Africa are just suddenly the best team in limited overs cricket again. Oh, but I did leave one win off the list. In 1998, they won the Wills International Trophy. It was the one and only event of its name. The next year, it would be the ICC knockout. The following time, I think it had already changed to the Champions Trophy. So even if you want to argue that the Champions Trophy is a major event, which it is clearly not, the Wheels International was certainly not a major event or anything like that. For instance, to win this, South Africa only had to be successful in three games. It counts as an ICC tournament barely, and it's certainly not major. But if you're the most successful white ball cricket team of all time on a per game basis, then it's pretty weird that after all of that time, your South African cabinet has only a Commonwealth gold medal and a tournament that no longer even exists. But let's get back to the major tournaments because you may have noticed that I left the 2015 one off. And I suppose we better get there. Because in that semi-final against New Zealand, South Africa chose to bat first, despite the fact that the New Zealand clouds were coming in. It's not the worst sin in the world, and they still actually went on to send a pretty reasonable target. And there was even a South African who would hit the winning runs. He just wouldn't play for their side. When Grant Elliott was 12, he wrote down that he wanted to play in a World Cup final. That dream was, of course, for his birth nation. Unfortunately, his dream became South Africa's nightmare. Elliott was a Hauteng player who never quite made it. He was good enough to play professionally for a few South African first-class teams, but he wasn't a mainstay, and his career probably would have been fairly limited there. So he moved to New Zealand in 2001, and it took him seven years to make his debut for New Zealand. By that stage, he had developed as a person and a cricketer. And he would end up a good enough player to send his own home nation out of a World Cup. And a week later, when his adopted home New Zealand failed, he stood up again and was the top scorer. So here's a South African man who was good enough to top score for New Zealand in the World Cup and also send South Africa home. How do you unwrap this as a South African fan? And of course, we know that it kind of happened again, against the Netherlands. Colin Ackerman made runs. He's barely made a run all the way through the two World Cup campaigns for the Netherlands, and then makes runs against, well, South Africa. Brandon Glover, who's been in and out of the side, comes in to play against South Africa, and he takes wickets. Both born in South Africa. And then you have David Miller at the crease, South Africa's last hope. He gets a short ball from Glover, he swings it away, gets a top edge, and Roloff van der Merwe chases it out towards the boundary. He dives, takes the catch, and is ecstatic. It's not the first game that Miller has ever been dismissed in a match with Roloff van der Merwe's fielder. In a 2014 first-class match in South Africa, van der Merwe ran out Miller. At that stage, they are just two South African professional cricketers, both hoping to still play for South Africa. They both already represented their nation as well. Because Roloff van der Merwe played 26 times for South Africa from 2009 to 2010. And his next major impact against South Africa in the World Cup is taking the catch that sends his nation out of it. And of course, 
it wasn't just this moment. That's what we were talking about before. With South Africa, it's never usually one moment. It's the accumulation of them. When you peel back, it wasn't just about Grant Elliott. There was the Vernon Philander thing. Before Mark Belcher misunderstood DLS, South Africa was already playing poorly. They were behind in the game in 1992 as well, and they'd struggled in an earlier game against Australia in 1999. It's always more than one thing, but there's always something. At this World Cup, it was the Netherlands beating South Africa. But before that, it was the unrelenting rain in Hobart. And then it was also Shadab Khan's counter-attack, followed by, again, more rain. And it's incredible to think that the Netherlands scored their first decent score across two World Cup campaigns, and it just happened to be against South Africa right when they needed a win. But of course it was, because this is what always happens. This is a multi-generational, multi-format hoodoo that includes rain, mass, rogue South Africans, 12th men sledgy, comedy runouts, and kind of everything else. It isn't one thing. It's the entire ICC system that seems to be against them. But the one constant is the world's best ever bilateral limited oversight has no major silverware. As Sean Williams said, this is a World Cup. South Africa is going home.